Fat Force Radio. Fat Force Radio is rated M for mature. Or should that be immature? Hey guys, Dustin Wynn. Hey, this is Scott Snyder. This is Paul Dini. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. You're listening to Bat Force Radio. This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Bat Force Radio, the Batman and DC Comics podcast with no limits. Tonight we are joined by the Bat Force Times in New York. Hello, hello. And it's going to be a whole bunch of New York people for some reason here tonight. We've got the Grumpler. Yes. Jesus. <laughs> Believe. And everything Batman, Dunk. What up? And yes. I'm Robin Cross, not in New York. <laughs> and uh, today's guest has been given the task of taking Harley Quinn through the current future state event at DC Comics, as well as continuing past that to a new ongoing Harley Quinn series beginning in March with art by Riley Rosmo. Welcome for the first time to Bat Forest Radio, Stephanie Phillips. Yep. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you for taking the time to, to join us here, especially you. You really didn't know any of us. Uh, I just recently introduced myself and asked you to come on. So thank you for uh, the leap of faith and joining us. Yeah, of course. So how's everything uh, in your parts? Pretty good. I'm I'm also in New York, so uh, a little uh, cold. <laughs> so outnumbered this week. It's <laughs> over. over. <laughs> I'm from Florida, so anytime it gets below 70, I get confused. So. Oh, <laughs> okay, so usually when we start off, we like to dive right into like an origin story, but mm -hmm. I kind of want to preempt that um, because with Harley in particular, when people read that there's a new Harley Quinn series coming, they're immediately going to have questions because in recent years there have been a, a few different takes on Harley in comics. Um, there's been, you know, the, the sort of sillier take going back to the new 52 where she's talking to taxidermy at animals, etc. But more recently you've had things like the white Knight universe, criminal sanity and Harleen where she's been uh, given a considerably more, earnest approach and sort of given back a lot of uh, the the dignity that some people want to see in the character. So what can people expect from your Harley as we step through Future State and into the miniseries? Or uh, through through the miniseries rather than into your ongoing? Yeah, uh, so I think some of the ones you just mentioned, like that really earnest approach to her is something that we really consciously wanted to follow. Um, in particular, something that I wanted to do I really want to play with her intelligence, which, you know, I really do think Harley is one of the smartest people in the room and the jokes kind of help her in a way. So she gets to use them as a way to, um, I think today we've been talking a lot about how Hugo Strange is going to be like kind of this main bad guy in the universe. And I really like pitting Harley against people with just giant egos because Harley is smarter than them, but she doesn't have the ego. And so I think, you know, it gets a lot of people confused when they hear the humor and they're like, how does this person have a PhD? And I think that's awesome. Um, so I want to play with that. Uh, and also, you know, coming out of the Joker war, we have a really um, kind of fractured version of Gotham that's being rebuilt, um, you know, new things going on in the city, new faces. And where does Harley fit into that? Because she's not exactly new, but the city has kind of changed in her absence. So I would I would say that the setting is really dark compared to some of the like more vibrant things that we got in New 52, which I absolutely love. Um, but I would say that we're putting like kind of a vibrant character in a really dark setting and especially seeing things like her having her throat slit by punchline. These are things we don't want to forget about. So these are all things that are going to haunt 
kind of our Harley run um, and really just playing with someone that's kind of living on the corner between sad and funny. Um, and, and that concept of like, sometimes the funniest people are actually the saddest and what is behind the jokes for Harley. Well, those are two good points that you checked off right at the beginning, because uh, a lot of us in particular uh, enjoy more of the that earnest approach to Harley, you know, having her in more uh, uh, a more respectable sort of uh, sort of characterization drawn, draw, you know, written in a more easy to respect light than than the goofier stuff. And also yeah. having her located back in Gotham, because that was the thing with her last solo run is she was not in Gotham through all of that. So uh, those are two cool things to have her main series, having her back in Gotham and uh, present in what is happening in the, the, the main line uh, universe. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of a big draw for me as well Is like, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to take on someone like Harley, I, I personally really wanted that to take place in Gotham and just have her get to interact with, people around Gotham obviously Batman makes an appearance often um and we see at the end of Joker War her kind of um kind of trying to say like I'm gonna do something that Batman can't do I'm gonna try to kill Joker and uh her actions kind of put her in a slightly better favor with Batman than I think we've seen in quite some time and I think that's a really fun place to be with Harley, which is like now figuring out if we're back in Gotham, she's not really Bat family. She's not really accepted by that side completely, but she's also not a bad guy. So it's a kind of a weird place for Harley to occupy and for her to figure out. And I think that's what makes this so fun is to write that like homecoming of Harley Quinn back into this Gotham universe. So for for anyone who is reading the Future State miniseries, you know, issue one is out so far. We're just waiting on on the second. Uh, would you say that the the way you're presenting Harley in there is uh, sort of a a good uh, level of what we can expect to see in the miniseries or in the ongoing? Rather, I keep mixing that up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I I mean, I think getting to write Future State before the ongoing is really cool because I got to kind of take the chance to get the tone that I wanted. Um, so I kind of have these two issues where I was like, all right, how do I want Harley to sound? Um, what is the balance that I want between her being funny, clever and intelligent um, and also smashing things with a hammer, of course. So um, like, what is that balance that I want to strike? And I got to really, I think, set that up before going into the ongoing. So um, in some ways, I feel like it made writing those two issues and then writing issue one of the ongoing it felt like issue one it's like it doesn't really feel as much like a really fresh issue one in that like I know the character a little bit better now so it was nice to get to um play with her a little bit before going into just like a big ongoing issue one because I got you know I, I felt like I knew what I was doing a little bit better and uh it, it's nice uh to see you be able to set the stage right from the start with Harley showing that she's smarter than Jonathan Crane. And, uh, you know, I, I may be reading this wrong, but I feel the whole time through issue one where she's sort of doing the quid pro quo thing, you know, I'll, I'll do what you, what you're asking me to do, but I want you to do this for me. It mm -hmm. feels like she's playing him to, to just, she's playing along just as much as she needs to, to, to get what she wants. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, I think, too, at times, uh, one of the fun parts about her humor is that it's never I feel like it's never completely random. So when she's using that humor to push somebody's buttons like Jonathan Crane, she's really measuring that person. Like, how can I get them to react? How can I get them to break? How can I push them in the direction I want by making them think that I'm an idiot and that I can't abuse the situation to my own purposes. And I think that that's absolutely one of the most fun aspects of writing Harley is doing unexpected things and how all these people, good and bad, really don't know what to expect from Harley at times, um, which is also cool getting to write her, you know, right off the bat in Harley ongoing number one, we we have Batman and getting him to come in and be like, all right, let me survey the situation. What is Harley going to be doing in Gotham now that you've, you know, got an apartment? What does this look like having you back in Gotham? And that's kind of cool, too, is like, how is she going to shatter the expectations of even Batman um, by doing things that maybe even the good guys don't expect? 
Interesting. Stephanie, I'm how, just much, how much of, of you is in, is in this Harley? <laughs> That's a good uh, question. Because uh, it, from the way you describe it, it, it sounds like there's, you're a PhD yourself. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that is, that's a great question. I, I think that that was definitely one of the things that I loved about Harley coming into it was being um, a Jewish woman with a PhD. I was like, oh, there's like a lot of stuff about Harley that I really want to highlight uh, <laughs> while writing her that I feel really connected with. And uh, I also, I feel like understand how grad school might make you go a little crazy and want to hit somebody with a hammer. So <laughs> um, <laughs> there's definitely some identifying and um, a lot of empathy with with her. Um, the more that you write her, the, the kind of deeper in her universe I get, the more I feel like I'm understanding somebody who's just been through a lot and she's trying to figure out kind of where she fits now coming back into Gotham. And I think something that's really interesting is you have other characters with redemption arcs as well, you know, thinking about someone like Catwoman that's also kind of towed the line between good and bad and how different Harley is in that she's, you know, now she's like, I want to make amends. I want to do something good for the city. Um, and I can't just let it go. She's not very good at letting things mm. go for better or worse. And uh, I think, I think that's kind of cool that she gets to react in a very different way that she doesn't just have this kind of, uh, anti-hero streak like Catwoman did. She is really trying to figure it out in a very, very Harley Quinn way. It's almost like uh, you know, returning to your roots in a way. Yeah. I mean, she didn't, you know, she she didn't start out this way. She went to school like she lived a normal life up until the point she met the Joker. Yeah, absolutely. So now that we've covered uh, sort of what to expect, I would like to dive into an origin story now. So (laughs) as far as you go, uh, what was your inspiration for for writing in general and also uh, what led to taking that road to writing comics? And how did you eventually make your way into uh, into comics? Uh, So I came to it through I guess the PhD kind of so I went to grad school um, I did my master's and then I went straight into the PhD and while doing the PhD there's this um, kind of quote that they would tell us that was you know publish or perish so if you want to be a professor if you want to be a good PhD student you, ha- you just have to keep writing and keep publishing and so I would publish stuff that would be put behind a paywall and it's stuff that you know I cared about and spent a lot of time on um, but having it behind a paywall and then kind of seeing who was reading it and it's like, okay, so the, like there's two clicks. One is like maybe my dissertation director and the other is like my mom. So it <laughs> felt, <laughs> it kind of felt a little, um, a little empty and, you know, that's not to demean the work of others in my field because they do really amazing things. And I'm not sure I was somebody doing amazing things. I was a grad student, you know, trying to figure it out. Um, But it just kind of hit me that I was like, you know, I'm not sure, like, after all that I pour into this, like, writing that I'm doing constantly, am I getting what I want out of it? And um, I took a little time off from the PhD to initially I thought I wanted to write video games. Um, And then, you know, I kind of fell in with uh, some guys that I knew that wrote comics. And uh, they were just like, why are you not writing comics? I did not have a good answer for that. Uh, Hmm. Mostly the answer was because I don't. I don't even know how, like, how, how do you just show up one day and say, I'm going to write comics now? So, um, yeah, there was a bit of a, uh, you know, someone in the comics industry just going like, well, to write comics, you just have to write comics. And I was like, oh, okay, well then I guess it's that easy. Um, but yeah, I went and hired a man house who, uh, worked with me at black mask on my first comic series. And, uh, I wrote the devil within and, uh, it was, picked up by Black Mask and that was my first comic and then I quickly realized that I was hooked and I just I wanted to be better I wanted to learn way more about what I was doing so I was like well I guess I'm just gonna be continuously writing more comics and then I got to the point where this is uh yeah my my full-time career now just kind of kept doing it cool uh was there anything in particular, like when you you said that you wanted to to learn more about doing it and and how to be better, were you looking to uh, to any other writers, maybe the people that that you knew that were in it or or others? 
Yeah, I mean, I was reading a lot. So uh, it was kind of like, you know, what do I like uh, moving into the industry, which is cool. You know, I, I like Jason Aaron a lot. So um, a lot of I, I mean, it's a little bit later now, but I really like the Conan run. Um, and then also looking outside of comics too, uh, Eric Larson, not not comic Eric Larson, the uh, <laughs> author, novelist Eric Larson. Uh, I really like historical fiction. So I was trying to find things I liked as well that I could kind of pull into the comic world, which is then where things like Butcher of Paris came Um from taking a real story and kind of adding my own kind of fictionalized spin onto the serial killer in Nazi occupied Paris. Uh, So that I would say was very heavily inspired by other writers I like that maybe weren't necessarily in comics, but I thought it was kind of a cool thing to get to take something like what Eric Larson does, like these really individual small moments in giant pieces of history and really make them approachable. And so writing what is it, a five issue mini series about something that took place in World War II kind of let me, um, I think, feel out the kind of things that I wanted to do for creator owned and then developing those skills. And um, I mean, I use them all the time in things like Harley, which is fun because I I still have access to a lot of like academic journals. So writing (laughs) Harley, I read a lot of like psychology journals, which is um, fascinating. So I, I, you know, there's some behavioral studies that I've kind of gone down rabbit holes reading so that when I write Harley, I'm coming from a position of someone that, you know, I, my PhD is not in psychology, but I've also asked a lot of friends too that are PhDs in psychology to just be like, hey, what articles, books, what things should I be reading? Um, you know, talking to them about their route through it. So, I mean, I think some of those things are all connected for me. Like, I, I feel like the PhD kind of helps me get there and that all these writers that are outside of comics kind of helped influence what I'm doing in comics. Interesting. How now, about, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, Rob. No, no, you're cool. Say, how about, uh, I, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, I'm sorry, but how about the, the, I can't even pronounce it, the, the Muay Thai fighting? You're, you're yeah. into that as well, correct? Yes. Is, yeah. is any of that going to show up in Harley Quinn? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I nice. love choreographing fight scenes. Uh, it cool. is. <laughs> after stepping outside the ring, I would say it's the most fun that I get to have is like, um, and, and getting to work too with people that are also martial artists. Um, I did Wonder Woman with Megan Hetrick and Megan Hetrick did, um, I believe, Taekwondo, which is always fun because like I'll lay out a fight scene and she'll come back and she'll be like, what if we did like counters and like whatever <laughs> blocking? And I'm like, hell yeah, let's do that. <laughs> so it, it gets really exciting when you have people on that. And of course, Riley on, on Harley Quinn is really into doing stuff like that too. And um, his fight scenes are so dynamic and he does a lot mm. of cool stuff with like insets in the pages and making the pages look somewhat unexpected that it's really fun to come up with something for a fight scene that might be a little like a little unusual for a fight scene in a comic but know that Riley is going to like execute something like you've never seen in a fight scene yeah. uh, we have some uh, I don't think we can show them off yet but he did some that involved like a Batman fight scene in our issue one where oh like I've just I don't think I've ever seen anybody draw a Batman page like this where like the page is literally Batman and there are just these things going on inside of it that I'm just like wow you took what I considered for the fight scene and just elevated it so getting to work with people like that that can visualize like if I explain to him the fight scene and then he goes and visualizes it in a very unique way it's really cool to see that take shape on the page. That's really cool to uh, to have people who have an intimate understanding of fighting uh, handling that. I've spent a little bit of time learning how to fight and a lot more time watching it. And one thing that bothers me to no end watching movies or TV is seeing oh you do not throw a punch <laughs> like that. You 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 know you don't throw a kick like that. There, there's no power in throw. And and it bothers me the same in comics too. I'll see someone in some awkward pose, even it, like. <laughs> I've seen Harley holding like her hammer, swinging her hammer in some weird way. Like, what? Wh- why would you swing it like that? It, yeah. So it's it's very cool to to know that the people handling it uh, will have knowledge of how how one would actually fight. Yeah, and I think fighting styles too kind of equate to personality, which is a really unique thing to play with with Harley because she's such an exaggerated, like excitable character that. 
you know, I'm, I'm a very structured fighter. So then thinking outside the box, like I got to write a book with um, an ex like KGB operative or Russian operative. And I re- I remember I wrote a scene for him where the fight style was just really structured. And he was like, this is not how a Russian op would fight. And I was like, well, what do you, what do, I don't know what that means. Like, this is how I know how to fight. <laughs> and he was like, well, this guy would use his surroundings. Like there's a coffee cup. He would throw the hot coffee and like use these elements outside of, you know, as a structured fighter that has rules and like a referee in the ring, you don't think about like throwing coffee in somebody's face. And I think that that was a moment that also opened me up to this, like, you're right. Not everybody is going to fight the exact same way I do. And not just talking about different martial arts and and disciplines like Harley Quinn is elastic and, uh, you know, she's got gymnastics and great fighting skills, but she's also really smart and good at using her surrounding in a way that isn't just going to be like, she's not just going to stand there and square up with somebody like I might. So how do I get her to think about what's around her, the people around her and do something really creative with that? And that's been a really cool uh, challenge too, is like coordinating things with um, like a foam finger or a feather boa (laughs) or something. um, So you're still getting a really dynamic fight scene just in a way that has kind of a Harley Quinn spin on it. Sounds good. Now a character like Harley, she's obviously uh, a marquee, you know, a marquee name really well known in pop culture so i'm sure there was no shortage of people who wanted to take this you know new harley series beginning Uh, how did you find yourself uh getting that gig um you know i think i still ask this a lot (laughs) um (laughs) i i wish i had a great answer for this i did some we can make one up if you want Oh, yeah. I beat somebody up um, (laughs) with a coffee cup. (laughs) Yep, exactly. Exactly. Uh, (laughs) Uh, I mean, I think the honest answer is just I did some short stories with DC that went really well. I kind of started forming really good relationships with editorial. And um, I did Future State before I knew that I had the Harley ongoing. So I think in my mind, I was like, I have two issues of Harley Quinn. I want to do the best possible thing that I can do. I did not know that there would be the possibility of a Harley ongoing. And um, I think it was like the week I submitted issue two of Future State. They called me and they were like, did you like writing Harley Quinn? I was like, well, sure. Who wouldn't like writing Harley Quinn? And uh, they asked if I wanted to stay on. So that that was um, that was a really cool phone call to get. And uh, my mom thought I was dying because I was crying when I called her. Today. Oh, my God. <laughs> she, oh, no. she, she's so I think as I'm crying, she's just like, how can I get a plane ticket? I don't know what's wrong, but I'm coming there. <laughs> my daughter uh, is either dying or she got hit with a coffee cup or a foam finger. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely don't think I sounded happy, which is really, <laughs> I was very happy. So it was hard to explain that that was a uh, exciting and, and happy thing. So, um, so, all, 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 so all you knew was that you had the two issues and you decided to, ju- to just go for it. And you did this, this really cool little thing where Harley is sort of like Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs, where, you know, she's on the inside and she's telling you what is basically the police how to uh how to track down these people they've been having trouble tracking down Mm -hmm. yeah i wanted to give her a position where she got to kind of show off her knowledge of of gotham and uh i thought it was really fun because you get to do something where it's like her kind of psychoanalyzing all of these people that we know in gotham and also critiquing gotham a little bit like (laughs) Um, she kind of goes down this rant about like pyromaniacs in issue one. Yeah. And like, I went and found a bunch of articles about like what it actually means to be a pyromaniac and how many people actually are pyromaniacs. And then I was like, well, that's odd. Cause there are a lot of like straight up pyromaniacs in Gotham <laughs> and that percentage is not making sense. So it got to be really fun because I think Harley is someone that will like take hold of a tiny thread and chase it. 
And that's what writing her is like, where sometimes you get this tiny thread of something and you just have to chase it. And that's kind of how her dialogue goes. Like, that's how she thinks and how she writes. And every once in a while you have Crane being like, hey, pay attention. We're not talking about pyromaniacs right now. Like, come back. And um, that's that's a lot of fun to write. And as as a writer, you get to learn, I think, a lot of really weird new things that show up in the script uh, because I'm chasing those threads <laughs> all of the time um so that gets to be uh i guess really exciting for someone that likes to just write different things because harley's kind of always on new threads so i thought i thought um uh, just like robin had said i i got uh a hannibal feel to it excuse me <clears throat> and uh then you know while i was reading the book i was like well you know this is interesting because you know uh crane is is a doctor as well and she's a doctor and he's you know all into that fear stuff or he was um you know so i was like all right you know this this could be interesting these two the they i mean i guess they're, they're working together now but they are you know kind of pitted against each other uh, it's a, it's an uneasy alliance i guess at this point i don't know what you know we'll see what happens next issue but i yeah. thought that was really interesting well thanks yeah I, I wanted to give her someone that was almost like her opposite but since i was going for the psychology angle i really thought it should be a psychologist so that was one of the things that i initially asked to do was like i knew going into it that we would kind of have her in the magistrate's clutches and uh initially DC was like yeah you can kind of make somebody up that maybe is a representative of the magistrate that's like her kind of like her handler um kind of like we saw in Silence of the Lambs and I was like man what if the like Clarice thing was Jonathan Crane and uh <laughs> DC like I was on a call with a few editors and they were immediately like oh my god like we want to do this um and I think they like they had to go get permission for us to do it and as soon as they did they were like yep we've we've got our Clarice it's gonna be Jonathan Crane so wow. uh, I thought that that would be perfect and then you know they I kind of gave them a list of um, other people around Gotham, I wanted to see her kind of psychoanalyze and take down, but I wanted to show it as like the power of Harley Quinn, even when she's in a cell, you know, she can figure out how to trap Firefly and Pig. And I think that that's a really cool way to show her intelligence is like even stuck behind this weird prison of the magistrate, she still can exert this intelligence and influence over the rest of Gotham. Yeah, it puts the focus on her, you know, like you said, on, on her intel intelligence, not just the, the suit or the, the clown stuff or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something we wanted to continue in the ongoing as well. So there's like a few things I think we set up in Future State that will um, continue a bit into uh, the ongoing. So obviously we're going like back in time. So you're going to see like the beginnings of the magistrate in Gotham and, uh, you know, the tone that we got to set up. But yeah, the clown thing is something that I kind of wanted to look at, which is like Harley Quinn fell in with that, that gang and that role as Harley Quinn with the Joker. And we just had Joker war. So like, where are all of these clowns that worked for Joker? And we're kind of looking at that as we go into Gotham, which is like, people are kind of on like a witch hunt for clowns. So I guess clown hunt <laughs> for mm. all these people that worked for Joker and uh, Harley Quinn kind of feels like she really understands them in a way that others don't because she also worked for the Joker and was like kind of led around a bit by him and manipulated. So um, she will have a special kind of empathy for the people that are struggling in the wake of Joker war. So uh, with the absence of a Joker relationship uh, can you say anything about whether or not uh, you will explore any of maybe her other traditional relationships? <laughs> the Ivy question? <laughs> or, or anything. <laughs> yeah. No, I... I uh, so we are doing, with Laura Braga, kind of like a prequel to the ongoing series. It's called New Roots, and it goes in um, the Batman Urban Legends anthology. It's a Harley Quinn Ivy story that kind of sets the stage for what's going on with Harley and Ivy as she moves back into Gotham. So, um, I mean, she's coming back into Gotham and in Joker War and definitely Catwoman, you're kind of seeing glimpses of where Ivy is. So Harley doesn't currently know where Ivy is, but our the Harley that we have in this story is very much still in love with Ivy. It's just a matter of 
most of Gotham actually doesn't know where she is. <laughs> so, um, you know, that will play into our story as well. See, so like I, I knew that you had that that story coming up in the anthology. So I asked about it to make you talk about it. So just like I was, I was just doing a thing. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> I, I think a, we but, can start showing pages from that off soon, I think. I mean, it, it's drawn, and I'm really excited about it because Laura did just an absolutely incredible job with those pages. So um, I hope we get to show them off in the next week or so. You're getting spoiled with artists right off the bat because <laughs> Laura's stuff is great. And also the freedom that you'll get with Riley because like Riley with sometimes his his style can be like, a demented cartoon kind of world mm -hmm. and he can do you know some really uh silly out there stuff but then at the same time he can also draw an issue like he did that uh batman who laughs one shot during uh during the first dark knight's metal you know that that origin yeah. story of the batman who laughs which is one of the most twisted issues that dc has put out in a long time so that range that he has gives a lot of freedom where uh, you guys can take uh, your stories yeah, I, I mean, Riley, his style, I feel like fits so perfectly with the Gotham that we're portraying, too. And I think like you're hinting, like the style also feels like it sits really well between sometimes dark and twisted and also cartoony and funny. And I feel like that's the perfect place for a Harley Quinn series to live, which is like right on that corner, right between sad and happy, uh, you know, right between funny and traumatic so um those are kind of the two lines that we're constantly trying to play with is a harley that's been through a lot of stuff and bringing all that back to gotham um while dealing with new stuff like hugo strange um being an absolute jerk face to her so um that is you know another person that of course dc was like yeah you just really like demented psychiatrists and i was like yeah it's uh, let's bring them all bring them in <laughs> And and with Harley's background, that's uh, fun for her to to play with some psychiatrists. It's yeah, I, I I love it too because I also asked a friend um, who's a psychology professor, and apparently there's like this kind of ongoing battle between psychiatrists and psychologists, where like psychiatrists can sometimes be really demeaning to psychologists because psychiatrists can like write scripts and prescribe medicine. And so I, I really love this angle that like Hugo will come in and be like, I'm a psychiatrist. You're just a psychologist. Yeah. Like just somebody with a PhD and like tons of clinical hours. Like <laughs> clearly Harley is not an idiot, but I, I really love that we get to kind of play with that ego and that it actually fits with like a real life dynamic that's going on in that field. I equally enjoy the fact that psychiatrists and psychologists secretly want to fight each other. I know. Who knew? <laughs> Somebody give them coffee mugs and <laughs> foam <laughs> fingers. The annual oh, battle. <laughs> yeah. Nerdiest fight ever. <laughs> I don't know that there is any winner from that fight. <laughs> yeah, Just the viewers. <laughs> Hugo, Hugo Strange is a great character, though. He, is, uh, he has his own issues as well. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, one of Batman's oldest villains. So that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And that was kind of my, one of my interests in Hugo as being like the giant overarching umbrella villain that we're dealing with is really getting to have somebody that could like pull in a lot of the history of Gotham and the Batman universe. And so, you know, Hugo showing up thinking that he's going to be dealing with Batman and that he's all big time. And then when, you know, Harley shows up to kick his butt and he's like, really? Like, do I not even <laughs> warrant Batman and also her getting to kind of pick apart the like dressing as Batman thing like <laughs> like what's with that yeah. <laughs> getting her <laughs> really push Hugo in that way as well like you know Hugo will think he's pushing her buttons and being like you're just a nobody and she can flip it on him so fast and getting to see her really dismantle somebody that is just on like the highest horse imaginable um, has been a ton of fun to write that dynamic. And of course, Riley draws just an incredible Hugo Strange. <laughs> yes. oh, that's cool. And, and Hugo is uh, a traditionally underused character. You know, he's, he's not someone that you see him popping up in, in every story. 
Yeah, and I, I get why he can be a little tough, you know, trying to figure out, like, what do you do with this character whose thing was dressing up like Batman and, like, figuring out Batman's identity, like giving that person a slightly new arc because it's not like he has this one specific power that you can put into different situations like the dressing like batman thing it's like you have to find the right place for hugo's brand of weird and creepy and i because he's not just gonna dress like harley in your book right exactly (laughs) that's not happening (laughs) Um, i hope i didn't just fuck something up (laughs) no No, but i I would change it Right, right. <laughs> but I think that's that's really fun to get to have Harley be like, uh, what the hell is this about? Like, why are you dressing like Batman? But also have Harley as somebody that's like, hey, if everybody in the Bat family has a Bat logo on their chest, like, do I put a Bat? Like, you know, Harley figuring out her relationship to the Bat family while also having someone like Hugo who's like, oh, I just really like dressing up as Batman for kicks and giggles um you know getting to have her explore what it means for her to imitate versus Hugo to imitate I think is important for her kind of discovery in Gotham too I, I'm I just trying to I, shut up well, sometimes for you guys to talk <laughs> yeah uh sorry I'm kind of losing my voice but um as a writer do you find it a challenge when the art styles change like so much or because I was kind of really surprised to like see this in an anime style. But mm-hmm. then once I saw the split panels and it led to those fighting sequences, I felt like it really pumped up the scenario. And in my head, I kind of imagined this as like an anime movie mm-hmm. and I felt like it just made it so much richer. But um, as someone that's writing Harley and having the art styles change, do you find that a challenge or do you think that kind of it helps you a bit? I think it's kind of cool getting to play to different strengths of different creators is um, I think one of the benefits of Harley because she's such an elastic and dynamic character that, you know, getting to write for Laura Braga, um, someone else that hasn't been announced that we will be doing some Harley with, which is really cool. Uh, Riley Rosmo, Simone DeMeo, like, all of these people get to bring a really cool style to it. And um, I feel like I'm writing for them. So, you know, writing something for Laura, I know I'm pretty familiar with Laura's work, you know, reading her work back to like Witchblade. I've always loved Laura and uh, you know, I, I really wanted her to do some Harley with us. So I was very specifically writing a script for Laura Braga. And in the same way that like my script to Riley looks nothing like my script to Laura um, and we'll sometimes be uh, start things off by just saying, like, please don't hate me, Riley. Um, <laughs> but it turns out, like, you know, I, I just think Riley and I, you know, getting to be on so many together, so many issues together, we also just have this, like, you know, we are going to talk all the time and um, make sure that things that we are building in issues one and two, by the time we get to issue nine, you know, we are going to have payoff for all these little things that we've built in, that everything has had so much thought in it that, you know, the window placements in a building that we are creating will have some kind of significance. And um, that's a really cool thing that I have not yet had because this will be like my longest running series um, so getting to have that is a really, really cool facet to staying on the character for a while. Yeah, I mean, do you have anything in mind as far as how long you, you know, best case scenario, how long uh, do you have a, a timeline plotted out of how long you could you could ride this ship for? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked when I was offered it, like obviously plotting out like a year's worth of Harley, some other kind of tie-in things. Um, but yeah, we we definitely talked about like what these kinds of things set up for future runs. You know, obviously things change all the time. And so I don't, you know, expect or count on things. But um, of course, I will be on Harley until they uh, drag me away from it. So that's, cool. <laughs> that's hopefully the plan is, you know, to stay on. And, you know, of course, Warner Brothers DC I don't have a whole lot of control over it and um yeah I mean if people dig it hopefully they'll let uh Riley and I just keep doing it cool well I feel like um the character alone like speaks for itself but like the way you you're the writer and what you what you're mentioning already something that a lot of Harley fans have been looking for um like you know she's playful and fun but everyone enjoys an intelligent Harley Quinn 
And um, the characters you mentioned so far, I'm looking forward to it. I'm pumped. I can't wait. And then you're working with, um, I'm also, I'm a huge fan of Laura Braga. I love her art. Um, spoke to her numerous times. And um, that would be fun to watch too. Can't, looking forward to it. Yeah. Oh, she's so talented. And getting to have um, Ivan Placencia, who's coloring it, um, is also coloring oh, wow. what we did with Laura. Wow. And uh, that is uh, it's been gorgeous. So getting, nice. getting to have Laura draw both Harley and Ivy and have that tie into, you know, what we're doing with Riley. Um, yeah. And we're bringing in a lot of new characters as well. So we definitely have some familiar faces. Um, we're building in, you know, some, some new characters that Harley gets to kind of work with a kind of sidekick character, though I use that word um, only because I don't really have a better word for it, but I don't, I don't really want to call him a sidekick and Harley doesn't either. Um, but we announced him today. His name is Kevin. <laughs> he's, he's pretty awesome. Um, he's like equal parts cronk and, uh, like a Labrador and he's lovable <laughs> and intelligence. He's, uh, gigantic. Uh, like I just, I love that when he stands next to Harley and, you know, she's plotting something out, he's like four feet taller than her. Um, <laughs> So it's just kind of fun to see that dynamic. Um, but he's also really kind of a deep character. So this is somebody that also worked with uh, Joker and was arrested during the Joker War. Um, so you kind of get to see somebody else that has a has trauma from the Joker, but in a very different way than Harley did. So this is somebody that's been around and near all the same things as Harley, but kind of sees this as like a celebrity figure. Like, you know, he may have worked for the Joker and was arrested, but that doesn't mean he really ever met Joker or Harley, but he definitely saw these people. And so, you know, coming into into Gotham and like running into Harley or Batman and he you know running into Batman he's like oh my god you are way scarier in person <laughs> like, <laughs> like I didn't realize how tall you were up close or these kinds of things and um that's really cool to write like you know talk about earnest I would really say that Kevin is just this really earnest character um that I feel like I hope people love as much as we have loved really writing him and um, you know, Harley trying to help him adjust. Like one of her things in Gotham is like, how can I help other people? And Kevin becomes almost like this project. Like, how can I help him adjust after, you know, he was arrested, he went through these things in Joker where he did really terrible things and he thinks he doesn't really deserve a place in this society anymore. How can I help him? How can I build this person up? So it's really positive and it's kind of heartwarming in a way that uh, Harley... Uh, struggles to be that open with, and I think Kevin kind of helps her communicate emotion a little better. And uh, in, in the images that are out, he doesn't have a being involved with people like Harley Quinn and Batman kind of look to him, so it's uh, an interesting juxtaposition of his uh, what appears to be his demeanor versus uh, the people that he'll be uh, running around with. Yes. <laughs> we kind of love that about Kevin. He uh, is clearly somebody that has wanted to fit in. And, uh, you know, Harley went through the same thing with learning to kind of stand on her own. And I think Kevin is a natural follower in a lot of ways. And that's something that he will kind of have run-ins with with Hugo in terms of somebody just saying, like, you know, you are worse than Harley. Like, Harley, got a, like Harley found a way to stand on her own and you're following the person that followed Joker kind of deal. So... Um, you know, having Kevin ask himself a lot of questions like, am I or can I be any better than the person that both he used to be and better than someone like Joker or these kind of horrible people that have helped destroy Gotham um, and also make amends for his part in some of that. So, um, yeah, I, I really like getting to add that character to Harley as well, kind of give her a bit of a foil, have her kind of analyze herself through Kevin and what Kevin's going through and also give her a chance to just be really open with another human in a very platonic way. Um, you know, there's that, there's no romantic relationship between the two. They are partners. They get to grow a friendship together. And I think that's really cool to see with Harley. And now uh, you get to wait for the day that, uh, you know, maybe if, if he's uh, well received enough, maybe we see uh, Kevin show up in something else. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely hope well, other people like them too. There, there it is. That to maybe get into the expectation of what Kevin might be like. Let's assume that you know they were doing 
uh, another movie that Harley was in, you know, whether it's another Suicide Squad or another Birds of Prey. If you had your choice, who would you select to play Kevin? Oh, wow. Hmm. That's a good question. Um, wow, I don't even think that I can think of a celebrity that matches that. Um, the weirdest thing is Kevin was based initially on a dog named Kevin. Um, so, like, the real-life version of Kevin was a really happy dog that, like, helped people. <laughs> <laughs> and I I just loved that there was this like dog out there that was named Kevin and then there kind of got to be this uh, I was watching Emperor's New Groove because I got Disney Plus and I was just watching old things and I was like I love this like really just helpful Kronk who's like on the side of evil initially because he's kind of just following the way um, and I cannot remember his name now but the guy that plays Kronk's voice is kind of sometimes what I think of now with Kevin. Um, though Kevin is way less self-assured than Kronk. Uh, am I saying his name right? Kronk? I think that's his name. Kronk and Yzma. Yeah, I think it's Kronk. Kronk and Yzma. But um, yeah, so I, I don't know that I've ever based Kevin in reality, uh, but I will have to think about that. That is a good question. So, but he's based on a, a happy dog who helps people. We we had a show in yeah. Canada about a happy dog who helped people, and <laughs> that that show was called The Littlest Hobo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all for happy dogs that help people. Um, I, I would say Kevin is far more dynamic than a dog, but uh, the initial concept. Oh, came... Hobo was very dynamic. I'll have you know. Oh, okay, <laughs> <Hobo> good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know where uh, where bringing up a hobo takes us, but uh, did anybody <laughs> else uh, did anybody else have anything they want to ask before I uh, I lead us into other things? I was curious if a uh, clown hunter was going to show up in this book. Not not physically yet, at least. Um, so there are lots of references to kind of where things are left between clown hunter um, and Harley in the main. Batman story so uh you know we we make plenty of references to that and mm -hmm. and what she went through with him um but given uh Clown Hunter has I believe now his own backup stories um oh. in, in Batman um like Harley might be appearing there but Clown Hunter is not specifically appearing in ours gotcha and there's plenty of mentions, uh, like, I mean, at times we do have flashbacks. So, you know, I've been asked if Punchline is in it and it's like, there's a technicality there where it's like, I mean, I could say technically, yes, she's in a flashback, which um, we've shown part of so far. Like, I think it's one of the pages that DC has showed off. You see a small flashback to Punchline cutting Harley's throat because this is just... Mm -hmm. You know, this is a momentous thing for Harley to have somebody else stand at Joker's side and have this person end up getting the upper hand on Harley in an instance is uh, and it becomes a very physical reminder. Um, Harley's costume was designed to hide the scar, so we didn't want to get rid of it. But we also have her wearing kind of like um, almost like a neck, like a scarf thing tight around her neck. Um, and we we don't want Harley or readers to forget this because it's a big part of where Harley is currently at mentally, I think. The trauma from that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think, uh, Charles, you in here right now? Uh, I think it's time that uh, this shouldn't be as intimidating as it might sound, but uh, we like to cap things off with the lightning round. Awesome. So the lightning round is just, you know, it's essentially a series of dumb questions. <laughs> and uh, But it's just about uh, letting people get to know uh, about you outside of, of just comics. So usually cool. Charles does it, but I don't know. Yeah, they're really silly. Yeah, they're a little fun handful of silly questions that they actually date back to the history of how we formed as an influencer group, like the, the M&Ms and the, the deadlift thing. People, A lot of people don't realize that, but... I think almost everyone in the industry that has to do with Batman at this point. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with the lightning round. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're silly fun questions. But Well, you know, being that you're in New York, I think the number, the first question should be easy. But um, your preference, New York style pizza or deep dish pizza? New York style. 
All right, that's a good. We don't want to send. We don't want to send you back to Magaland. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna try to bring back something that we haven't done in a little bit, but I'll give you a warning now. So as we go through the rest of the lightning round questions, maybe keep in the back of your mind that if you can come up with a lightning round question for the next guest, mm-hmm. uh, you can fire away with one at the end. All right. We we get asked all of this. <laughs> You, you, you only ask the Joey one, don't you? Oh man! Oh, the Joey one's good. So is the Adam Hughes one. Is oh. is uh, or <laughs> oh, oh god, oh, or the the, the, the these these are really mind bending, thought provoking, <laughs> deep philosophies. <laughs> well, Joey's was is the thing. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna Joey throw Lawrence. that one out. So yeah, we had Joey <laughs> Lawrence on the show. Yeah, Whoa. Joey Lawrence from Blossom. Whoa. Um, and he actually asked a. An, an interesting question. So if you had the choice between living to be a hundred years old, but you would be, you know, you would live the life of a pauper, you know, you would be virtually okay. penniless or you could live to be 60 and, mm-hmm. but be wealthy. What, what would be mm-hmm. uh, your preference there? What road would you choose? Oh my gosh. Who's live, question live, live a, Joey, <laughs> Joey Lawrence, Lawrence. <laughs> from the guy from Blossom. Uh, oh i don't i don't like this question um maybe so you can live a short life with tons of money or a nice long full life but you're 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 living a fairly meager existence right right i mean maybe that one just because i would bank on the fact that like my brother makes good money so then i i could be uh nice i could live a long time but also mooch off of him for a long time. Yeah, and he's, <laughs> young, he's younger, so <laughs> I feel like that's a good plan. <laughs> uh, um, pl- plain or peanut M and M's? Um, plain, I guess, but I'm more like pastry than candy kind of mm. thing. Dessert. What's your favorite dessert? What's a good dessert that? What's a, re- a dessert you would recommend to a friend? Mm. I have been in quarantine making uh like this pistachio cake. Uh, oh, that yeah, good. it's it's you really good. Pistachio. My mom makes it, um, but like you know, for my birthday and stuff, I couldn't be with her, so she shipped me ingredients to make the pistachio cake myself. <laughs> I, I I was going to say that sounds like a Florida thing more so than than a New York thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, I that's definitely more Florida. I would say. like uh there are things up here that I will say like pecan pie or things like that and yeah. people up here are like what no, it's yeah. like it's delicious what do you like pecan pie and sweet tea it's it's oh, very God. southern <laughs> we got we got to ask clay okay. about this uh about this pistachio pie uh if you i don't even think martha's bakery has pistachio pie i gotta bring that up i've been on the hunt for pistachio chocolate chip cookies and Oh, oh man. Man. I need that in my life. <laughs> yeah, so that's amazing. I, I think anything and pistachio would make it just not to hijack happy. the lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> it always the, the, let's always face, about the grumps. I guess. Always <laughs> turns into food. No. It, it always becomes. Food. No. Remember when we did lightning round with Kelly Jones and it turned into a thirty-five minute discussion about pizza. About New York pizza and the water and the the water in New York and the pizza. <laughs> now, now, if if you could have dinner. With any human being that has lived throughout humanity, dead or alive, who would it be? Bruce Springsteen. Nice. Did he perform yesterday? I think I missed yes. it. Yes. Yeah, he did. And I, oh, I of did? course, uh, <laughs> I was the idiot over here, like, thinking about regular, you know, inauguration where you would have, like, people come and perform a couple songs or whatever. So, like, all week I've been, like, I'm going to make up what I'm guessing Springsteen's set is going to be. And then he plays, like, one song and doesn't come back for the rest of the night. Oh, and I was very damn. mad. <laughs> I was, like, <laughs> I was here for Bruce and only Bruce. And <laughs> one song. What? It was you know, very good. You know what Springsteen did? Um, What was it? What was it? 12, 12, 12 after Hurricane Sandy. I think it was uh, uh, on 12, 12, 12. It was... Um, a charity concert where a bunch of celebs, Rolling Stones, and everything. But when yeah. Springsteen came out, man, he killed that shit, man. The the boss. That, that was awesome. that was fantastic, man. Well, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Hmm. Um, I think something like Raven, where you would have like 
maybe telekinesis so that I could bring things to me, but also make myself fly. And that might be a cheat answer because I feel like you get (laughs) Uber (laughs) Eats. Uber Eats isn't gonna come bring me the remote. Like I don't want to get out of bed. I just want to bring the remote. (laughs) Uber Eats is gonna come bring the remote from one room to the other. I'm a little creeped out by that service. (laughs) You, You might be able to train like a smart cat to handle that one. Oh, my cats are very smart, which is why they don't do things like that. <laughs> it's a slippery slope for them. Well, um, what was the best piece of advice you have ever received and who gave it to you? Um, hmm. That's a good question. Um, I, I would maybe my dad. So my dad and I both really like music and my love for Bruce comes from my dad. And I remember in high school, like I get really overwhelmed. Like I try to do a lot of things all at once. And my dad told me to think about it like, um, like a Springsteen song or something where you have like parts of the music come in at a time and it all builds And my dad told me that I have to think about things I'm working on like that. Like you don't have every instrument immediately come in on the first note. Like, you know, you'd have a little bit of flute and then like the saxophone comes in and then the piano or things like that. And it builds to like a larger piece and you have to be okay with like building to that. And uh, yeah, my dad's full of really good little idioms and he's a smart guy. So Mm. I dig that. Um, I think that's it for me. Uh, Did you have any idea of a question that we can might might be able to pass on to the next guest? Hmm. I was trying to think of like it could be anything. It could be silly, <laughs> ridiculous, whatever. Just you know, anything. Yeah, so some some of the questions are awful. <laughs> <laughs> I I would go with something very specific, no like favorite Britney Spears song, like. Okay. Like really get toxic. into somebody's yeah like <laughs> like are they, are they are they into toxic or are they very classic like hit me baby one more time like I think that tells you a lot about a person mm, that'll be a fun one yeah <laughs> we can do that one for sure and I'm, I'm gonna throw Adam Hughes again I feel like that's a perfect question for Adam Hughes Adam Hughes <laughs> What was the dog poop question that that one was pretty funny that that was oh, uh man. that was Brad Walker's you mean. Oh. Yeah, Walker. Yeah. But we that someone someone emailed us to scientifically answer that question, so that one sort of just got destroyed. Oh. It wasn't fun anymore. <laughs> <laughs> someone sucked the magic out of it. Yeah. Oh, but uh, yeah. I want to throw a very specific one at you because of uh, the Muay Thai stuff. Uh, favorite fighter? Um, I guess if it was somebody kind of currently fighting, I watch um, Tiffany Van Soost, who is a female Muay Thai fighter who's been doing a lot of uh, lately kickboxing. Um, She's been transitioning, but as a Muay Thai fighter, it feels weird to not say someone like Senshai is probably the person. I don't even know if anybody outside of like really specific people that watch Thai know who Senshai is, but he's, um, he's a Thai fighter and he is like kind of silly so like he'll he's famous for doing things like these weird cartwheel kicks where he will like actually knock somebody out or like break their neck doing this um but we would sit in the gym all of us and just try to perfect this weird like it's really tough because you're doing like a one-handed cartwheel type kick while on gloves like with boxing gloves on um but i also just always like sunshine because if I like following him online. He's really fun and like has fun with it, like a sport. And uh, I I like people that can smile while punching somebody in the face. So, (laughs) you know, who's fun for seeing stuff like that uh, on Instagram. Do you follow a Lawrence Kenshin? Uh, His his Instagram is uh, striking breakdowns. Uh, That's a really cool page to follow. It's just uh, it'll be a, a video that shows, you know, someone using a particular technique in in a real fight scenario. And then he breaks it down and, you know, just explains what they're doing, how the technique works, how they set it up and all that stuff. So oh, it, it's awesome. just, just a cool page. I'll, I'll send you the page. Yeah, thanks. That's really cool. Well, um, favorite movie. I'm curious. Favorite movie. Um, yeah. My favorite movie is Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay. Um, followed closely by Tombstone. Oh, man. <laughs> Huckleberry. Yeah. That's, the, that's, that's Val Kilmer's. 
Yeah. My opus, man. I, he'll never do a better role than that. I, don't I collect Doc Holiday artwork. Um, so I will ask a lot of creators uh, to give me Doc Holiday artwork, like uh, Brian Stelfreeze. Um, I'm trying to think of who else is in it. I've got Tom Rainey in the collection. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's grown quite a bit. Like, I feel like some people saw it online and just wanted to draw a Doc Holiday. So, um, I've had a lot of fun making people draw Doc Holiday for me. How, how long until you get one from Riley? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like I can't pull him away from drawing Harley right now, but at some point I, yeah, I definitely need to make him do it. He'll squeeze it in. He's a nice Canadian. I know. <laughs> <laughs> he is. No, I, I'll have to, I'll have to get that on the list. Hmm. That's awesome. I feel like watching right. that now. <laughs> do do we? Uh, I think we let you get back to life at this point. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, was thank great. you so much for taking thank the time you. to be here. Uh, we we've all really enjoyed the first issue of of Harley. Looking forward to two, and then to uh, your main series starting with Riley in March. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited about all that too. I'm glad we got to talk about it. Yeah, that was awesome. It was fun. Best wishes. Have a great night, and uh, hopefully we will chat with you again soon. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you guys so much. Have a good night. Well, Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.